The Trinity can be a challenging topic. It is a challenging concept that most people have not fully grasped, myself included. There is only one God, yet how are there three persons in one God? How did Jesus pray to God if he is God himself? It seems like there's levels to the Trinity. And if that's the case, there's differences amongst the beings within the Trinity. But then I thought, they're all God, and God is one. So it is a difficult concept to grasp, and that's what we're going to try to understand in today's video. God himself gives the best explanation of the Trinity in Isaiah. This comes from John Barnett Online Teaching. Let's check it out. Now, in the middle of this, I already mentioned this, right in the middle of all this, in chapter 48, God gives the best verses about the Trinity. Look at chapter 48 and verse 16. God himself 48, in 16. the Old Testament. Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Okay, quiz. Everybody quiz. Here's an oral quiz. Who is talking in verse 16? Who is the me? Good question. If it's the Lord God, that's God the Father, and His Spirit, that's God the Spirit, who's left? Yeah. All three of them are here. Now look who's at this. Who's the me? I, who's I want the me here? This. God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Holy Spirit. But the Son mm -hmm. is not the Holy Spirit. They're two separate persons. The Son okay. is not the Father. They're two separate persons. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. I love this drawing. This is from Wayne Grudem, the, the yeah, theologian, cool. the systematic theologian I was telling you about. But God is the Son. And God is the Spirit. And God is the Father. And there aren't three gods. There's one God. Mm. But he eternally exists in three persons. This is what the systematic theology says. In describing the Trinity, the New Testament clearly distinguishes three persons. Those are the three outer circles who are all simultaneously active. They are not mere modes or manifestations of the same person. That's a, that's a branch of Christendom called the oneness theology. And it's very incorrect. They say that it's just manifestations uh, uh, that, that there are modes, that, that there is this one God who has God. a mode that he's sunning and a mode that he's uh, okay. spiriting and a mode that he's fathering at times. No, no. It isn't that God is flipping but like a mm. dial. He's three at the same separate time. persons at the same time that are not the same, but they're co-equal, co-eternal, Mm. It's one God and three persons. You know, St. Augustine or Augustine, you've heard of St. Augustine. You Let me pause it there for a sec. I, I, might, I, might, I might add this at the end of this video. Sam Shimon makes a, a nice point on this. He says, uh, you might have trouble grasping that. How can, how can one being be existent in three beings at the same time? Like, it doesn't make sense. Okay, it's, you can't grasp it. But isn't that perfect? Isn't that exactly what we would expect from God? Well, let me let me just play the Sam Shimon clip right here. The Trinity is something that God has revealed about himself. Where people get tripped up is because there's nothing in creation that's mm -hmm. identical to the Trinity. It doesn't make sense to them how, if you're one being, you can be more than one person. But now let's question that. Yeah. If you believe God is beyond comprehension, and unlike anything in creation, <clears throat> would it surprise you and shock you that God's mode of existence, the way he exists, is completely anything, completely like anything in creation, and there yeah. be nothing identical to it, and so that the way he exists would transcend our ability to fully understand? Yes, that would make that sense. Makes sense. So that's yeah. number one. The Trinity is unlike anything in creation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's nothing identical to the Trinity, and we're not able to fully comprehend it, which should be expected if we're dealing with an infinite mind, a being that's beyond comparison, who exists in a completely different way than the way creatures do. 
So I think that the fact that this is, it's hard for, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around the, this concept makes it make sense. The fact that it doesn't make sense, the fact that we can't understand it, that we can't comprehend it, makes it make even more sense. But anyways, let's jump back into this. What he said about the Trinity, he said the Trinity is like the ocean. He said a baby can sit right on the edge on the sand and play and splash the water and do great. But he said, if you go out too far, you'll drown. He said, that's what the doctrine of the Trinity is. He said, it's so deep, it's so hard to understand. Just stay right on the shore where you understand what it's saying. <laughs> At Christ's baptism, all three persons were simultaneously active in Matthew 3. When the son was being baptized, the spirit descended on him. We talked about The this. son was standing there, the spirit descended on him, and the father was speaking from heaven. The Bible is clear. There is only one God. And yet he exists and has always existed as a trinity of persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To deny or misunderstand the trinity is to deny and misunderstand the very nature of God himself. Because that's how he revealed himself. What, look what he says in Isaiah 48, 16. Come near to me, hear this. Who's talking? Who invites us to come unto him? Jesus. So Jesus is talking in the Old Testament right here in, in chapter 48 and verse 16. I mean, couldn't that be and God the Father is, as well? From the time that it was, I was there, and now the Lord the God, context. Father, and His Spirit have sent me. Wow. Okay. Uh, here's I a mean, little bonus. Let's look it up. Let's look at the text. Okay, here we are. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. Let me scroll up a little bit to get some context here. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I am the last. So this is God speaking, okay? Come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. I mean, who else could it be speaking right here? Who else could be speaking right here? And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Who is this me? I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. This is a trinity right here. Okay, so now I'm very curious. How do, you, how do you Jews reconcile this? What, what's the Jewish commentary on this? Draw near to me. Hearken to this. In the beginning, I did not speak in secret. From the time it was, there was I. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. From the time it was, there was I. Okay, so here's it's a Jewish commentary. From the time the nation ceased fearing me, there I brought Abraham, your father, near to my service. So this is God speaking, saying that he's bringing Abraham to his service. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit, said the prophet. And now the Lord God has sent me and his word. This is an intermingling of words. The one who said this did not say that the first part of the verse was said by God, and the second part by the pro. Okay, so see, how do we know? How do we know that? So what they're doing is they're breaking this apart. Come near to me and hear this: I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was I was there. They're saying God said that. But then now Abraham is saying this, and now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. But in the Christian Bible, this is all in, in one quote, so it's being said by one person. But in, according to Jewish commentary, it's being said by two people. And see, the, why is that not designated in the actual text? Why does it flow like it's one person saying it? Anyways, let's put that aside for now and come back to the video. I, I threw in, I took a picture real quick. Do you know, this is how I witness to Jewish people. Someday you might talk to a Jewish person. This is Zechariah chapter 12. Okay. And Zechariah says, the burden of the word of the Lord. I'm not teaching Zechariah, but I just showed you this page. 
<laughs> this is the clearest. If you actually circle Lord in yeah. verse 1, the Lord in verse 1, verse 2, the Lord is still talking, I will make Jerusalem. By the way, this is very prophetic. Verse 3, I will make Jerusalem. Verse 4, and that day the Lord, I will strike all of the nations. Verse 7, mm -hmm. the Lord. So it's, see, it's the same person. In chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 7, and look, the same person is talking, the Lord. I is still the same person, so see, I drew the line. And I will pour, now look at verse 10. At the climactic moment of the second coming, they, the Jewish people, will look on me, the one that's talking, whom they pierced. Pierced. And look what I wrote in my Bible. When was Yahweh, Jehovah Yahweh is Lord, Lord, I, I, Lord, 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 I, I. That's Jehovah God. Is me. When was Jehovah Yahweh God pierced? Only once. Christ on the cross. Zechariah 12 is one of the most beautiful ways to present the deity of Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is... I, okay, we got to look at a Jewish commentary. I'm, I'm very curious. Okay, see, this is why I wish I knew Hebrew because it doesn't say pierced and it doesn't refer to me in these in these Jewish commentaries. See, like, look, look here. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look to me because of those who have been thrust through with swords. Because of those who have been thrust through with swords. And they shall mourn over it as one mourns over an only son. Let's go back and look at the, the Bible, right? New King James Version. And I will pour on the on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look upon me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Look, let's look at this other commentary. Uh, but I will fill the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem with a spirit of pity and compassions, and they shall lament to me about those who are slain, wailing over them, as over a favorite son. So it's tough. It's tough because it's, it's two different translations here that's resulting in two very different interpretations. But let's jump back to the video and allow John Barnett to finish up his thoughts. It's the only hope that he is the one, the promised one, to a Jewish person. Uh, Bonnie has sat with me on airplanes, taking Holy Land groups on airplanes. You know, you're flying from the New York to or whatever to Israel. Would be awesome. And the plane is filled with Jewish people. And I would sit there, and this, I'll never forget on the plane, I was sitting there reading my Bible, getting ready for Israel, and a Jewish man came along, a very elderly Jewish man, and you know, elderly people talk very loudly. You know, they, <laughs> they are very hearable. And he came down the aisle and he said, What are you reading? And I said, Zechariah. And he says, ah, oh, the Tanakh, you know, the Old Testament. You know, he was so excited. He says, what are you reading in the Old Testament? And I said, well, can I show you? And I went, Lord, Lord. And I said, I have a question for you. And he was leaning over, leaning I'm over, leaning over, watching. Say. And I said, and Zechariah said, I will pour on the house of David. Oh, he said, the house of David. On the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he went, Jerusalem. You know, he was so excited. The spirit of, of grace and supplication when they will look at me whom they pierced. And I looked at him and I said, when did God get pierced? And he turned around and walked down the aisle. He knew what I had just done to him. I showed him that his Bible proves that Jesus Christ is the one that was crucified. It's one of the best places to see that. It's, that's the thing, dude. That's the thing. Because it doesn't say that here or here. Like, to those that are Jewish, what does your Tanakh say? Because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. I want to make sure that... I want to make sure that I'm reading what was actually written. You know what I'm saying? Because if we have the right translations, what John Barnett just showed here, it's amazing.
But anyways, let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. And hopefully this video helped in your understanding of the Trinity, even if it's just a little bit more. But let me know your thoughts down below and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.